Revelation chapter 22 says, And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river there was a tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations." This is symbolic language, speaking of Christ. He's the river, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God. He's the tree of life for the healing of the nations. Pray that he'd be pleased to make himself known to us this morning. Let's stand together. Brother Tom's going to come and lead us in the hymn on the back of your bulletin. of life in trouble or in joy the praises of my God shall still my heart and tongue employ my heart and tongue employ oh magnify the Lord with me with me exalt his name when in distress to him we call and to our aid he came and to our aid he came. The hosts of God encamp around the dwellings of the just. Deliverance he affords to all who on his mercies trust, who on his mercies trust. Fear him, my sons, and you will then have nothing else to fear. If Christ the Son is your delight, your soul is in his care. Your soul is in his care. Please be seated. Good morning. For a scripture reading, would you please turn to the Song of Solomon's Chapter 5, Song of Solomon, Chapter 5. I was asked one time by comment from family members who don't know anything about God's grace, why is it that you going to church, and I understand why they phrase it that way, is more important than anything else that more important than family gatherings. And I suppose they see us religious going to a religious clubhouse. And what I want to tell them so bad is that I'm not coming to a church. I'm coming because of him. I'm coming because of God's darling son, the Lord Jesus Christ, my beloved And this morning, it's my hope that he will ignite that flame once again in our hearts. Because that's the question I often ask myself, why am I here? Why do I come? We have many reasons, but the one reason I hope that he would do for me this morning is that it's about him. I need to be where my beloved is. So as we read this passage, I hope he would do that for us this morning. Chapter 5, verse 1. I am come into my garden, my sister, my spouse. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb with my honey. I have drunk my wine with my milk. Eat, O oh friends, drink, yea, drink abundantly, O oh beloved. I sleep. And more often than times, I am in a slumber, but My heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that knocketh, saying, Open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. Lord, you're calling me undefiled. (laughs) For my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. I have put off my coat. 
How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? Here's my presumptuous, unbelieving heart in response to that. And I'll look at verse 4. In spite of that, my beloved put in his hand by the hole of the door, and my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open to my beloved, and my hands dropped with myrrh, and my fingers with sweet-smelling myrrh upon the handles of the lock. Oh, the fragrance of Christ. Verse 6. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself and was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. If you're a sinner saved by grace, you know something about God withdrawing himself just for a moment. It's the most debilitating, the most depressing, because you know there's nothing in this world or nothing... That could fill them, but he does it for a purpose. And that purpose is to cry out to him, to ask, to seek, to knock. And on top of that, verse 7, the watchmen that went about the city found me. They smote me. They wounded me. The keepers of the walls took away my veil from me. Oh, I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, if you find my beloved, that you tell him that I am sick of love. What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Distress, tribulation, naked peril, lawmongers, the enemies, the flesh. In spite of all that, we are still crying out for him. And here's their response. What is thy beloved more than another beloved? O thou fairest among women. What is thy beloved more than another beloved that thou dost so charge us? You think that your Christ is all? You think that he is the successful Savior? I'm so glad you asked me. I want to tell you who he is. This is who he is. My beloved is white and ruddy, the chiefest among ten thousands. He's the Lord of lords and king of kings. His head is as the most fine gold. His locks are bushy and black as a raven. His eyes are as the eyes of doves by the rivers of waters washed with milk and fitly set. His cheeks are as a bed of spices, as sweet flowers. Oh, his lips like lilies, dropping sweet-smelling myrrh. His hands are as gold rings set with the barrel. His belly is as bright ivory overlaid with sapphires. His legs are as pillars of marble, sovereign, unmovable, set upon sockets of fine gold. His countenance is as Lebanon, excellent as the cedars. Does this describe your Christ? This is my Christ. His mouth is most sweet. Yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved, and this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. May he be, he's here this morning. This one that I've described promised to be where two or three are gathered. And I believe that with all my heart. And I pray this morning in the preaching of his gospel any moment now that he would speak to my heart, speak to your hearts. Enable us once again to be told, I love you. I delight in you. <laughs> pray he would do that. Lord, we so thankful, Lord, that you would be merciful to draw us here to this place right now. Lord, that you would have mercy, and Lord, that how you delight, for Christ's sake, to speak to us, to reveal yourself to us, and enable us to worship you in spirit and truth. Who are we, Lord, sinners saved by your grace? And ask that you would reveal yourself to us, Lord, that we would just be so with much sick of love, Lord, that we would just embrace you and worship you. Lord, forgive us of our sins, Lord, and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Lord, we, we ask that you'd bless your word now and enable us to see you. Be with our brother again, Lord, and empower him and give him liberty. 
Lord, that you would get all the glory, that we would exalt you. For Christ's name's sake, we ask these things. Amen. Weishi is going to bring some special music down.
Thank you, Bree. <clears throat> I need thee every hour. Thinking about what Bert just shared with us and that hymn that we just sang, I was reflecting on something that I thought of this week. There are, it seems like, some folks that have a, a um, sporadic attendance, let's say, when it comes to coming to services. And um, there was a time when I thought that the problem was commitment. I don't believe that anymore. If a person is able to have a take it or leave it attitude about worshiping God, it doesn't have anything to do with commitment. It has everything to do with need. Need. God makes you to be a sinner. You're going to need him. <laughs> You're going to need his grace. You're going to need his mercy. You're going to need his word. You're going to need his people. You're going to need Christ. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 12. Isaiah chapter 12. We preach Christ crucified. The Lord's pleased to cause the Lord Jesus Christ to be preached from this pulpit. That I'm confident that if he's lifted up, he will draw sinners to himself. Because in light of his glory, in light of his grace, we see ourselves for what we are. Completely dependent upon him. Deserving of his wrath and hopeful for his mercy. And this psalm or this song that Isaiah sings concludes with that in verse 6. Cry out and shout thou inhabitants of Zion for great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee. In another place he said I inhabit the praise of my people. When John saw the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation, he saw him walking amongst the candlesticks. This is the place where he's pleased to make himself known. And sinners need to know him. Oh, Paul said I, that I might know him. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. I've not yet apprehended that which has apprehended me. Oh, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, I press towards the prize for the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He is the one I need. And Isaiah tells us in Zion, that's the church. That's where God's people rejoice together in the revelation that God makes of himself through the preaching of the gospel. It's the only place where his grace can be known. The revelation of God's sovereignty and his power might be observed in creation. The revelation of his justice and of his wrath might be observed in conscience. But the revelation of his grace and his mercy, the answer to the sinner's need, can only be seen through the preaching of the gospel. This is where I need to be, Bert. Who is this one who solves our sin problem? This one 
who promises to save us. Isaiah calls him the Holy One of Israel. In Israel is the only place where the Lord Jesus Christ is holy. It's the only place where he's holy. And people honor him with their lips outside of Zion, but their hearts are far from him. They do not believe him to be holy. They have made him to be altogether as themselves. They've made him to become dependent upon something they do, upon a prayer that they pray or a work that they perform or a decision that they make. And so they've robbed him of his holiness. They've robbed him of his glory. I remind you what Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6 when he said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. (laughs) And the seraphim were hovering over his throne. And what were they saying? Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. Heaven and earth is filled with his glory. Now that word holy, the, the best interpretation for that word holy means other other he's not like you and me in any way he's other than we are he's completely separate from sinners and man in his in his perverted idolatry will make jesus to be like himself but in zion he is the holy one of israel We bow before him and we say with our brother Isaiah, woe is me in light of his holiness. Woe is me for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips. My eyes have seen the king. I'm a dead man. Look who he is and look who I am. Oh, God have mercy upon my soul. Show me your mercy. Show me your grace. Take that hot coal from off the altar and touch my lips and purge me. (laughs) Forgive me of my sin. He's called the Holy One of Israel. That's a a very uh, frequent term that's used in God's word to describe Christ. But it's most often used in the book of Isaiah. Let me show you a couple places. Turn with me back to chapter 10. Isaiah chapter 10. Verse 20. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel, the residue of Israel, the the elect of God, the few that there are, And such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote him. Now who is it that smote us? It was the law of God. It was God saying, if you will do this, then I will have mercy upon you. That's what the law says. If you will, then I will. And, the, and, and, and we try to lean upon that. We think, well, I'll just try a little harder. I'll do a little bit more. I'll be more sincere. I'll, I'll step up my commitment. <laughs> and when God speaks, his remnant no longer stay upon him that smote him. Because if you're leaning upon the law, if you're leaning upon something that you do in order to earn favor with God and you're an honest person, then your conscience is constantly convicting you that you haven't quite got it right yet. You haven't done enough. Maybe a little bit more will be enough. And that law will smite you. It'll judge you guilty. That's all the law can say. Guilty. (laughs) Condemned. But what will the remnant of Israel do? They shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. (laughs) 
all the hope of my salvation is resting upon his finished work. No contribution on my part. He is the Holy One of Israel. I spoke with someone this week and it's a conversation I have a lot of people. I, 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 you talk to a religious person about the gospel. And ultimately, they're going to say, well, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best. And uh, I told this person, I said, well, you know, the problem with that is that God requires perfection. He requires absolute perfection. He will not settle for your best. And they looked at me and said, oh, you think you're perfect? And I said, I know I am. I know I am. Oh, you're so arrogant. You're so proud. You think you've never sinned? I said, no, I didn't say that. Everything I do is sin. That's all I can do is sin. And yet, and, 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 and they said, well, you mean to tell me in the eyes of God you think you're perfect? I said, most definitely. It's the only hope I have. The only hope I have is to be absolutely perfect in the eyes of God. How am I going to achieve that? I'm going to have to be found in Him, the Holy One of Israel. And being in Him, I have perfect acceptance before God. Turn to me to Isaiah chapter 30. Verse 9, and this is a rebellious people, lying children. Children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Don't tell us the truth. Tell us how good we are. (laughs) Tell us how much God loves us. Which say to the seers, See not unto the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. Get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from us. We don't want to hear about Christ. Get him out of here. Give us something that we can do. And then we'll be happy. And that's all Babylonian religion is about. Something you can do. I don't know a simpler way to to distinguish the difference between man-made religion and uh, the gospel of God's free grace than to point you back to a word in our text in Isaiah chapter 13. Turn back with me there. Isaiah chapter 12. Look at verse 5. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath... That's the next word. What is it? Done. <laughs> Done. There it is. There's the gospel. He hath done, and that word excellent means glorious. He has done glorious things. He has brought glory to God. John chapter 17, the Lord Jesus Christ said, Father, I have glorified thee upon the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Now there's the gospel. I've glorified thee. Sing unto him. He has done glorious things. He's accomplished all by himself everything necessary for the salvation of God's people. In Mark chapter 7 verse 37, the scripture says, and they were 
astonished beyond measure, saying, He hath done all things well, for he maketh both the deaf to hear and the blind to see. The seeing eye and the hearing ear are of the Lord. Job got it right when he cried, Salvation is of the Lord. He's done it all. The Holy One of Israel. And this is the only place where he's holy. Everywhere outside of the gospel of God's free grace that points to the Lord Jesus Christ as the only hope of salvation robs him of his holiness. But in Israel, in Israel, he's holy. And God's people bow. Ah. Uh, Psalm 98, verse 1, O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. The Lord Jesus Christ is the right hand of God. The Lord Jesus Christ is the holy arm of God. He's the strong arm of salvation, and he got the victory by himself. Religion's all about trying to get you to increase your commitment, isn't it? Just be a little more committed, a little more dedicated. Try a little harder. Stop doing this and start doing that. You'll be all right. If the Holy One of Israel makes himself known to you, you will become a needy sinner. A needy sinner falling at his feet. Oh, Lord, have mercy upon my sin-sick soul. I've got to have you. I've got to hear about you. And the older I get, the more convinced I am that what Solomon said about all the things of this world, vanity of vanities, all is vanity. There's no answers out there. There's no peace out there. There's no hope. There's no comfort. There, there's nothing to rest my soul on other than the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy One of Israel. Lord, make, himself, make him known to me. Give me rest for my soul in him, in him. He hath done. Notice the verb tense. It's past tense, isn't it? Not he will do for you if you'll do for him. He hath done it. It's finished. It was finished before time ever started. Hebrews chapter 4 makes that clear. The work was finished before the foundation of the world. The Lord Jesus Christ is called the Lamb that was slain before the world began. God established a covenant of grace. Whereby God the Father, according to his own will and purpose, chose a particular people and wrote their names in the Lamb's book of life before Adam was ever created. Before God ever said, let there be light, and there was, there was the covenant of grace. It's eternal. Been in the heart and mind of God forever. <laughs> forever. The Lord Jesus Christ entered into that covenant with the Father and agreed to pay the ransom price to shed his precious blood, to establish a righteousness for them that they could not establish for themselves and to satisfy God's justice by laying down his life for the sheep that God had chosen. And the Spirit of God entered into that eternal covenant of grace and agreed to go into the world and to make those for whom God chose, those for whom Christ died, willing in the day of his will and his power. Oh, he hath done marvelous things. 
He hath done glorious things. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit committing themselves to one another. Not a commitment to you and to me. A commitment to each other. To save a people. He hath done excellent things. What did we say that word excellent means? Glorious. Glorious. Things that glorify God. Majestic things. This is the only message of salvation that gives to God all the glory. Every other message of salvation that you'll ever hear out there is going to give you something to do. You're going to have some contribution to make. You're going to be able to bring something to the table, aren't you? And this message gives to Christ all the glory. He hath done excellent things. In creation, he did excellent things. In Genesis chapter 1, God said, let there be light. The earth was formless and without void. And darkness hovered over the, over the earth. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. <laughs> and God saw the light. And he said, the light was good. Christ is that light. Light has come into the world. The moon and the stars and the sun weren't created until the third day. The first day was light. God saw that light and he said, it's good. It's good. That's the light. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the light was the light. The life was the light of man. And the light came into the world. And darkness comprehended it not. Couldn't comprehend it. Until the light of the gospel shines in our hearts. In the face of the Lord Jesus Christ, we cannot comprehend the nature of God. Oh, but when he does, when he does, we now understand that our problem doesn't have anything to do with commitment. It has everything to do with need. Need. I've got to have him. I've got to have him. The theory of evolution is nothing more than man trying to rob God of his glory. That's all it is. He hath done glorious things. Hath done. He did it before time ever began. He did it 2,000 years ago on Calvary's cross. When the Lord Jesus Christ bowed his head and cried with a loud voice, It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He hath done glorious things. All by himself. He laid down his life for the sheep. He satisfied God's justice. In in, in, in his incarnation he hath done. What? Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord, a Savior. You need a Savior. You need a Savior. Now, if you're looking for a God that you can, that you can use like a bellhop and, and, and ring the bell of prayer every time you get in trouble in this world and you need a little relief, then that's not, that's not, that's not the God we've got for you. You can find that God out there in religion somewhere. There's plenty of them. This is a faithful saying. Worthy of all acceptation, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Now, if you've got a problem with sin, a problem you can't get away from, Christ is the only hope. He's the only hope we have. God left the glories of heaven and was clothed in the likeness of sinful flesh and suffered the contradiction of his creatures. What condescension. 
that God would leave his glorious throne and come into this world and be treated with such... Anger, hatred. In his obedience, in his obedience, he did wondrous, glorious things. We used to study this Bible in order to find characters in the scriptures that we could draw moral lessons from. And so we would look at the life of David and we'd look at the life of Joseph and we'd think, well, there's a moral application there that will help me to be a better person. We don't study this book like that anymore. We don't look to the lives of dead theologians. We understand that in the volume of the book, it is written of me To do thy will, O God. The Lord Jesus Christ came into the world in order to do the will of God. What he hath done, he hath done excellent things, glorious things. He satisfied the demands of God's law. Turn to me to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 7. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not. Offerings for sin that come from the hands of man, God says, I won't accept it. I won't accept your dedication. I won't accept your commitment. I won't accept your gifts. I'm going to accept one thing, and that's my son. You look to him. Sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not. God wouldn't take it. Neither hadst thou pleasure therein which are offered by the law. The law says you got to do more. And God says, I won't accept it because you can't do enough. Why? Because I require perfection, perfect obedience. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second by the which will we are sanctified, made holy, set apart. How? Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all, he laid down his life. This is my beloved son. In him, I'm well pleased. God's not pleased with you. I'm sorry to tell you if you never if you didn't know that. I, I'm glad to be able to tell you. I'm sorry if it's such a shock to you. He's not pleased with you. He's not pleased with me. And there's nothing that you and I can do to make him pleased with us. That's what I'm telling you. That's what God says. God Almighty is pleased with his son. He's pleased with his obedience. He hath done glorious things. In creation, he hath done glorious things. In obedience, he hath done glorious things. And that's what God requires. God's glorified when sinners look to Christ alone for all their righteousness before God. In religion, if you listen to what's being preached in Babylon, you'll think 
that Jesus gathered up the blood that he shed on Calvary's cross and put it in a blood bank. And that you've got to go to that blood bank and draw it out in order to make it work for you. It's not true. The Father took every drop of that blood. It wasn't shed first and foremost for you and me. It was shed for the Father. It was shed in order to, in order to fulfill the requirements of that covenant of grace that God had established with the Son before time began. And God said, when I see the blood, I'll pass by you. It's not for you to appropriate the blood of Christ. It's not for you to go down to the blood bank and make it work for you. The blood's already before God. (laughs) He paid in full the redemption price for his people. Price has been paid. It's been paid. In the book of Hosea... Hosea's wife, Gomer. Gomer's a picture of us, and Hosea's a picture of Christ. And Gomer had played the harlot and ended up as a, on, on the slave market. And Hosea went and purchased her, paid the purchase price for her. She didn't have a word to say. <laughs> oh, he paid it in full and took her back to himself, didn't he? Have you played the harlot? That's what our sin is. That's what our sin is, denying our maker his glory and looking outside of Christ. He has paid the redemption price. I, I, I love the story of, of Ruth and Boaz. You remember when Naomi, Naomi told Ruth what to do and she just went and sat at Boaz's feet. And uh, then Ruth said, you sit right there for the man will not rest Until he has finished the work today. Today. (laughs) And Boaz redeemed Ruth and Naomi all by himself. The Lord Jesus Christ did not rest until he finished the work all by himself. The Holy One of Israel hath done glorious things. And he has brought to himself All the glory. Say, what about in sanctification? Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We'll begin where we left off a moment ago. Look at verse 10 again. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. And every high priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. Don't, don't become your own priest. Don't try, to, don't try to atone for your sins. Don't try to make things right with God. You can't do it. They'll never take away sin. But this man... Verse 12, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstools. See, that's what we are by nature. We come into this world at enmity with God. We are. We're God haters by nature. And what's he say? I'm going to take my enemies. I'm going to make them my footstool. They're going to sit at my feet. (laughs) They're going to beg my mercy. And they're going to listen to me speak to their hearts. I'm going to comfort them. I'm going to love them. I'm going to draw them to myself. They're not going to remain enemies. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. When was God's elect sanctified? (laughs) When he made that one offering on Calvary's cross. He was offered up for our offenses and raised again for our justification. He hath done. D-O-N-E. 
The Bible doesn't say you must do. The Bible says he hath done glorious things. And his church praises him for it. This is the only place, the only place where the Lord Jesus Christ is the Holy One of Israel is where he is worshipped for, for having had done all things well. Man-made religion that depends upon man to do something is feigned worship. It's just pretend. That's all it is. It's not worship done in the spirit. It's not worship done in truth. It's man pretending to be worshiping God when really he's worshiping himself. He has set himself up on the throne of God. Justification. He did it all by himself. <laughs> that no man is justified by the law is evident for the just shall live by faith. A man is justified not by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. You are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified in the name of of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. He hath done marvelous things, glorious things. Go back with me to our text. Verse 5, Isaiah chapter 12. Sing unto the Lord. Does your heart just burst with joy <laughs> and rejoicing? There's nothing, there's nothing else in this world that, that, that gives me this kind of hope. Sing unto the Lord, for he hath done excellent things. And this is known in all the world. This is known in all the world. Men that deny Christ, his glory in salvation, do it on purpose. They do it on purpose. The truth of the gospel is known in all the world. And if men want to deny it, they're going to have to lie to themselves. Turn to me to Romans chapter 1. Paul said in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ, who got the victory all by himself. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm thankful for it, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. There's no salvation apart from the gospel of his grace. To the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. In the gospel is the only place where the righteousness of God is revealed. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 10 to say that man goes about by nature to establish his own righteousness, being ignorant of the righteousness of God. That's the natural man. He's trying to, trying to establish some righteousness for God. But therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Looking to Christ, the author and the finisher of my faith. For the wrath of God, here's what I want you to see now. This message is known throughout all the world. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They've seen the truth. 
and they've denied it. Look what he goes on to say. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. Man by nature knows that there is a God with whom he must do. And he knows that that God is sovereign. He knows that he's omnipotent. He knows that he's immutable. He doesn't change. He knows that he's omniscient. And yet he denies all those things in order to set himself up on the throne of God. Look at the next verse. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Man's without excuse. If he doesn't believe the gospel, he does it on purpose. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise. They became fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like unto corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. truth of the gospel must come by divine revelation. And it will come to those that God gives grace to bow to the truth that he's, that he's made known to them. You deny the truth that God's shown you and God holds you without excuse. Without excuse. This is known throughout all the earth. Cry out and shout, O ye inhabitants of Zion, for the Holy One of Israel is in the midst of thee. Our merciful Heavenly Father, we ask that you would Bless your word to our hearts. Give to us faith to believe what you have clearly said. To rest our souls on Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Brother Tom. Number 488. Let's stand together.
me free. 